Welcome to lecture 13, everyone. In this lecture, we're gonna talk specifically about mental and physical health related supports. And to kick off this lecture, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you guys a video that we really will highlight the importance of mental and physical health supports and supports planning for individuals with intellectual disability. And hopefully this will give you guys um, maybe a newfound sense of importance as to why we have to talk about these things. And then when you go back and look through the Wyoming DD waiver, um, really pay particular attention to these things and making sure you guys can kind of see if they're adequate or not. Um, before we do that, though, I want to show you guys a little bit about Think College that I had mentioned um, in Lecture 12 um, when I'd given that example about, you know, the individual with Down syndrome that wants to go to college. And we looked at all of the possible um, preventative supports we could put it, put in place for that individual based on the etiology of their disorder um, and as to the causes of, of their intellectual disability. So before we kind of jump into that, um, I'm going to show you guys Think College. And so here, what you can see is this is the Think College home website. And what it is, is it provides a college experience for individuals with intellectual disabilities. On this website, you can look by state, um, and when I clicked on it today, it was being a little difficult, so I just um, also will take you to Think College Wyoming's page. But we actually have this program at the University of Wyoming. So if you go here, Think College, um, and the information is found through WIND, um, the Wyoming Institute for Disabilities um, website, and it explains the whole vision um, and mission behind it. And it's really allowing academic access, career development, campus membership, and this whole idea of self-determination um, to include individuals with, individ with intellectual disability in higher education. Um, and for more information can be found about it here, and additionally to some frequently asked questions and um, explaining the resources. You've got um, two really good videos, one of which this is a family that talks about sending their daughter um, to Think College Wyoming's program and all of the experiences and ex um, that all the experiences that their daughter was able to have. And again, it really allows for this campus membership and allows individuals with intellectual disabilities to still have a college experience. Um, we know that college isn't, like I mentioned, just about academics. College is really about so much more than that and really allowing um, to feel like you're a part of a, you know, feeling like you're part of a community, really get to meet friends, participate in sporting events and other extracurricular activities learn great life skills. And so if you're more, if you're interested in that, this can be really fun for you guys um, to kind of um, click around. So before we get into the specific lecture on um, health supports for individuals with intellectual disability, we're going to watch this video that, again, I think should really, for you guys, highlight the importance of focusing on mental and physical health support planning disability, going to hospital can be more dangerous than for the rest of us. There's concrete proof tonight that failure by medical staff to listen to, understand or offer equal treatment to the disabled has in some cases caused avoidable death. Tonight, one of the world's leading medical journals is publishing the results of a study showing people with intellectual disabilities are twice as likely to suffer an avoidable death as the rest of us, and the death toll is in the hundreds. Elise Worthington reports. Oh, she loved the horse riding. And she um, looked forward to the horse riding, and she would have been. Well, she was a competent horse rider. Got to admit. Maureen Mackelquam's life has come to a standstill. She's haunted by the death of her daughter Michelle, and tormented by the thought she could have been saved. They tr tried to revive her. <laughs> they couldn't do it. <laughs> She passed away a few minutes after. <laughs> Michelle had a mild intellectual disability, but nothing held her back. She danced and sing, that's her favourite, I think. Made her happy and actually made the whole house happy. In May 2009, Michelle became unusually quiet. I called the local doctor, so he came. He just said she had an ear infection and um, prescribed antibiotics. I'm very stopped for that. 
Hours later, Michelle had a seizure and was rushed to Bankstown Hospital. She was agitated and in pain. By midnight, Michelle was sitting on the floor, screaming, holding her ears and rocking back and forth. They gave her some painkillers for a headache, but that didn't seem to work. And um, I think it was about, about five hours before we actually saw a doctor. Michelle wasn't talking because she was, her headache, she got worse and you could see that. And I told her she's not always like that. She talks, she, doesn't, she can't talk now, she's, she's sick. She's got a bad headache, her, ear, her ears are hurting her. Michelle was discharged just after three in the morning. She put in a discharge note that she wasn't sick, she had a temper tantrum. And I'd say she does that because she had an intellectual disability, another thing. When Maureen refused to leave, the hospital called security. Michelle was sent home in a taxi. By the time they arrived, she could barely walk. Seven hours later, 28-year-old Michelle McElquam stopped breathing at home. An autopsy found she died from meningitis. I would love to say it was unbelievable in the 21st century, but sadly it is still happening and it's... Uh, it's gut-wrenching to hear those, hear those stories of human suffering that could so easily have been avoided. The coroner found staff at the hospital attributed some of her behaviour to the fact she had an intellectual disability instead of a serious illness. But this case is not isolated. Research released in the journal BMJ Open today reveals a disturbing pattern of unnecessary deaths in the Australian health system. We found that one in three deaths in people with intellectual disability was from a potentially avoidable cause. We accept that even in the highest quality healthcare systems there will be deaths from potentially avoidable causes. But the reality here is that the proportion of deaths from potentially avoidable causes was over double that seen in the general population. So we feel that this is quite a significant marker of a major health inequality. The study found people with an intellectual disability also had an average life expectancy of just 54. We know that government policy and services development for this group is sadly lacking. People with intellectual disability experience a large range of uh, potential risk factors for early death. These include things like cardiometabolic risk factors, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity. <coughs> Erin Sheehy has Down syndrome and an intellectual disability. Do you think that's enough for that one? Enough. Yeah, all right, so start on the next one. She comes to this program five days a week in Sydney's West. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so. Erin and her mum, Christine, are preparing for a big birthday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to stay here. Oh, oh for your birthday? Yeah. Wanted to stay for three days? Yeah. Wow. We'll have to talk about that. Yeah, please. <laughs> It'll yeah. be a big birthday if they want three days off. Yeah. <laughs> I want to. This is so good. Jeff. But Erin almost didn't make it to celebrate this birthday. She suffered from a major stroke at 25, which left her paralysed and unable to speak. It came completely out of the blue and was not connected to her condition at all. And it happened in the middle of the night. Oh, 61. She was in great pain and it became clear by the morning that she had lost her memory, complete memory of everything. Um, she became paralysed. Uh, she couldn't swallow. Within three days, the doctor ordered she be discharged. And this man had said to us, you can take her home. Uh, we've got her pain under control. And I said, but she can't do anything. And his words to me were, look, she has Down syndrome. How hard are you going to try? And I was shocked by that. Physically, I felt like I'd been punched because I just knew this man had made a social decision rather than a medical decision. And that was wrong. Some of it's about, about training and skills. Um, health professionals just not knowing um, that, you know, how, how to uh, accurately diagnose and treat 
people with intellectual disability. I mean, it, it can be hard because a lot of people with intellectual disability have very limited, um, very limited verbal communication. Specialised health care for people with an intellectual disability does exist in Australia, but in very limited areas. We know that there are isolated pockets of specialised health services for people with intellectual disability that have been trialled in different states, but there is no systematic response by government at a Commonwealth or state-by-state -state level in this regard. Researchers say, at the very least, a national system to monitor deaths and better training for healthcare workers is urgently needed. Soon if something doesn't change, more people are going to die and be young, young people are going to die. The coronial inquest into Michelle McElquam's death made 11 recommendations, which the hospital says it's fully implemented. But advocates say there's inconsistency in hospitals around Australia. There's just no way that it should be potluck about whether a person with intellectual disability gets decent health care, um, potluck about whether they live or die. Bye. I sometimes truthfully have nightmares that if Erin had gone to a nursing home she could have contracted pneumonia or something or some other health episode would have occurred to her and we might not have her now. Christine stood her ground. She insisted on the standard rehabilitation available to other patients and after months of care, Erin improved. She's a vibrant young woman with things to do, places to go and... People to see. People to see. <laughs> Elise Worthington with that report. For Australians with an inter... So I hope that highlighted for you guys the real importance why we need to make sure we look carefully at mental and health and physical health related supports for individuals with intellectual disability. Because while this that video clip was is a very recent clip um, out of Australia, that is it's not certainly is not contained to Australia. We definitely see the disparities here in the U.S. as well with mental mental and physical health related supports for individuals with intellectual disability. So we're going to kind of go through um, what mental and physical health is and how we can support it appropriately for individuals with intellectual disability. Also of note, I want you guys to think about, you know, you get to see um, the mothers of two of, of both those individuals, one that lived and the one that unfortunately died um, because of some difficult behaviors that were attributed just to, their, to their, her disability when in fact she was in pain and that's how she was um, communicating. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit in here too. Um, but the amount of additional, you know, last week you guys um, learned about family stress and how much more stress, it's always stressful when your child is hurting um, and needs uh, mental and physical health services and support. And, but the extra amount of stress that's added with having a child or a family member with intellectual disability and the amount of advocacy that's needed um, hopefully that'll also give you guys just a little bit more food for thought in that area. So what is health? How do we define health? Before we can talk about mental and physical um, related health supports, we have to understand um, what it is. So our health, again, the outcome again is overall well-being and health relates to our physical, mental and social support. So comprehensive supports optimize the health and well-being of individuals with intellectual disability. Uh, we recognize that disability is part of their human condition and part of them, but we want to increase their overall well-being. And I want you guys to think, is um, the absence of disability or the absence of disease de defined as health? Is that being healthy if you don't have a disease or disability? And when we think about health, that's certainly not the case. We just want to make sure that we use supports to maximize each of these areas to maximize overall well-being. So let's talk a little bit about community health supports, um, basic premises, and standards. So we want to make sure that we understand some of these things. And the first one is that health is a dynamic process. And it's a dynamic composite of physical, mental, emotional, social, environmental, and spiritual well-being. 
And we also recognize that humans are in constant physiological movement. So we never are just stagnant. There's a lot of stuff that's going on and it's really dynamic between these physical, mental, emotional, social, environmental, and spiritual pieces. Additionally, health is health promotion in general is multifaceted. So the focus is on promoting exercise and physical activity, proper nutrition and healthy lifestyles, reducing stress through effective stress management, which can, which can be done through predictability, control, and increased um, self-determination and um, empowerment, and then also accessing social capital that maximizes connections among people to form mutual support systems, community ties, and social networks. And these activities that are picked, again, need to be um, self-directed, and it's critical to make changes um, when necessary. It's also important, really important, um, that health supports are community-based, that they are occurring in the individual's environment, where they live, in their neighborhood, in their community, their town, their city, their state, to the greatest extent possible, that other individuals without disabilities have access to health support, so doctors, appointments, um, recreational activities. Um, and this really helps apply the principle of normalization to all aspects of health. Again, stress that all needed health supports are obtained by the same sources that everyone else. And that support should be designed to meet the needs of the individual in their community to the, to the greatest extent possible. Recognizing that the different stages may require different health supports, you may need to go to surrounding communities, you know, maybe to larger cities if we're thinking about um, here in Laramie, someone may have to go to Fort Collins or Denver uh, to get appropriate supports. But again, to the greatest extent possible, these are happening in their community. Also recognizing that evaluation is continual when we're looking at community health supports. So providing information to all stakeholders about the impacts of personal factors, supports needs, individualized supports activities, and health outcomes. Um, the information then should be used to help maximize our outcomes overall within this process. So make sure you understand these four premises. So what are some different types of health concerns? So let's first talk about spiritual well-being. And this is just, you know, good health that we know that requires access to clean water, nutrition, rest, etc. Um, it includes general health and illness and, in, and additional conditions that, with known risk patterns. Um, physical well-being really has to deal with the results of accumulated disorders created um, that can create some additional health disparities and can place an individual with intellectual disability at a greater risk for um, illness and a greater need for more frequent evaluation of health. So that's what makes physical well-being really unique for individuals with intellectual disability, making sure we understand do they have access to, again, all those things that promote basic physical health? Um, do we have a good understanding of what are some secondary health conditions? Um, and also what factors are in place or what barriers that put them um, at greater risk for illness, um, maybe not having as many access to doctors, dentists, those types of things. When we think about mental and behavioral well-being. This is making sure we preserve, really preserve our healthy mental energy. And we have the absence of internalizing such as anxiety and depression or externalizing behavioral difficulties like aggression. When we look at social and environmental well-being, this deals with participation in community events, and life activities such as marriage and um, romantic relationships, and also making sure an individual has a safe environment. And, la and lastly, we're talking about spiritual well-being. And this doesn't necessarily have to do with um, being religious or not or ascribing to a religion, although it certainly can, is comprised um, in this factor. But even if a person isn't particularly religious, um, spiritual well-being just makes sure that we have individuals have access to a community of like-minded individuals and that they feel connected on a spiritual level um, to something or someone or some things or some, um, some in groups of individuals. So when we're talking about health-related support needs, um, support needs assessment is really, really important. And we have to look at how much exceptional support is needed to enhance or maintain the health needs of an individual. So this could also be exceptional health needs such as respiratory care, feeding assistance, 
help with skin care, um, basic um, activities of daily living, um, and also maybe dialysis or other medical things. Um, and it's really, really important to understand how much, when we're doing supports needs assessment in this domain, how much more is needed for an individual to have access to um, a healthy lifestyle. The video really, I think, in that first clip, really highlighted the importance of looking at difficult behaviors and possible causative sources of difficult behaviors when we're talking about health-related related support needs, both from a physical and also a mental standpoint. So it's really important that we examine um, when we have difficult behaviors, we evaluate the communicative intent. Um, and that video, for example, it wasn't to be aggressive. It was communicative in nature. It was, I'm hurting, I have an earache. And if it was somebody else without an intellectual disability, quite possibly the, me the medical professionals might have taken it a little bit differently. Um, but because it was an individual with an intellectual disability in this case, um, they just chalked it up to having a disability. So really important to when we see causative sources of difficult behavior, see if it's not communicating some other, um, communicating some difficulty or discomfort or pain due to a physical health need. Um, also, we need to make sure, that, again, this is where it really drives home that we need to assess the function of the behavior. Why are they engaging in this difficult behavior? Um, causative you know, triggers can be internal triggers, external triggers, um, due to trauma or abuse, due to limited range of expression. This could be out of due to the, an illness or habit or just way that they um, communicate. And we need to be able to differentiate between what's a difficult behavior and what's a, a behavior that's trying to communicate a certain need in the physical um, or mental health realm that's not being able to be communicated. Um, exceptional you know, behavioral needs also outside of communicating the need for more health-related supports could be due to, you know, some exceptional behavioral needs could be stealing, assaulting others, injuring others, pica, um, some um, maybe suicide, sexual aggression, inappropriate gesturing or touching individuals. And we need to be able to differentiate these difficulties again from I'm communicating something. And we have to differentiate these um, these types of behaviors also from mental illness. So are these um, um, difficult behaviors um, learned behaviorisms or mannerisms that have been learned? Um, are they a product of maybe a metabolic disorder, dehydration, low blood sugar, again, pain? Or are they an actual difficult behavior that needs to be addressed differently? Um, again, we can't just treat all external um, externalizing behaviors or difficult behaviors as something that is wrong with the person or they're just trying to act out or be difficult. And I think a good example of this that I've experienced is I was on a plane once with an individual. Um, he was a couple seats um, ahead of me, but when we were getting on the plane, he would yell spontaneously, this very loud yell sound. And it was, again, a little off-putting, especially on a plane. Um, and people kept looking at him. And the more I kind of paid attention, just given what I do for a living, I figured out that he had probably a tick disorder and his tick um, expression of was the yelling and that it was exacerbated by stress um, and being on a plane can be very stressful and especially, again, obviously I didn't assess him, but just based on just paying attention to when he would engage in this behavior, it was when more people, and anytime anyone would walk by him or anyone would look at him. And I had the person sitting next to me say some pretty, um, I don't know, just for lack of a better word, rude things to me about how he just should learn his manners and learn how to behave on a plane. And I gently um, did point out that, you know, it may be because he's uncomfortable and he might have some other stuff going on that he can't control. So again, now communicative intent here, maybe he was in pain. I don't know. Um, certainly, maybe possibly from a mental health or kind of emotional standpoint, maybe health related, you know, physically health related. But again, it's really important to that when we see difficult behavior, we look at, is it a standalone difficult behavior? Is it also trying to communicate a difficulty, a physical or a mental health um, difficulty as well? And then these are different support activities um, for overall health. And this table is in your book as well. But the first piece is assessment. We want to really make sure we have a comprehensive assessment 
to really we look at how the client views their health or their health related supports and their needs. Um, this is done through, you know, preventative care, specifically dental care, which is huge um, with this population and lack of access to preventative dental care um, and providers that will provide it. Also, mental status exams and also looking at comorbidity rates and making sure our assessment and revision is an ongoing process that takes into account the individual's changing preferences, personal growth, life situation, and health status. And then based on this assessment, again, we're linking individualized supports. And from a, um, a health-related support stand standpoint, these medically-based supports need to improve um, exceptional medical health needs positive and through the use of positive behavioral supports, pharmacological treatments when necessary or appropriate, and making sure that we use environmentally-based strategies that reduce stress and increase personal control over um, their health. These supports activities must be of high quality. We want to make sure that they're based on current research and evidence-based whenever possible and um, also align with best practices. We want to make sure they're reviewed often because we understand that they change. And then making sure that there's also health promotion. And these are the more preventative type things. So this is providing dental care, engaging in exercise, proper nutrition, encouraging mental and social stimulation, allowing individuals to make contributions to society or their community, and understanding and helping them deal with any chronic conditions that they have. And again, the outcome is to recognize longevity in the prevention of secondary health conditions um, and reflect best practices and based on the expectation of a full lifespan of actively participating in society, not just existing. Um, so hopefully you guys now have um, an increased awareness of the importance of mental and physical health related supports for individuals with intellectual disabilities because again it is something that is often overlooked um, and we opened with that video that really showed you know the grave statistics that we're looking at preventable death individuals with intellectual disability are at a much higher rate than the general population as a product of having intellectual disability so thank you for your time. Any questions, let me know. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys in Module 3. Thanks.